Who gives you a little dog? My guys. Well, it is a cold, gray, yuck, <clears throat> normal winter day today here in the collapse of global industrial civilization. <clears throat> that would be Thursday, January 12th, 2023. And, uh, guys, you know, I feel like, uh, that, that I'm sort of being a little bit redundant and maybe even a little bit lazy, I admit, continuing to come over here to medium.com for my daily chronicle of the collapse. But I've got to say, I, I am continually shocked at the quality <clears throat> of the uh, journalism coming out of medium.com. <clears throat> and how these people who, who get it are out here just screaming into the universe, preaching to the choir, which is exactly what I am doing, uh, preaching to the tiny few people on this planet who give a damn about the biggest story on the planet in the history of humanity. Uh, but if you are trying to figure this out, and you are not subscribed to medium.com, uh, you're doing yourself a disservice. I don't know, where are you getting your news? From the mainstream media? Uh, <clears throat> so anyway, once again, I am back at medium.com, and, and, and there's just on today's Digest of Doom, uh, I, I could pick, there, there's three essays I could pick here, but we're going to go, I've mentioned this person, I don't think I've done a full essay, he or maybe she, uh, simply calling himself or herself B. B has 1.6 thousand followers, including me. B describes himself or herself as a critic of modern times offering ideas for honest contemplation. So uh, I'm going to put the <clears throat> link to uh, this excellent essay on here, which has all sorts of links uh, in, into a whole... Good Lord, a whole labyrinth uh, of other places that B will lead you off to. Uh, but he's, he or she sums it all up in this excellent essay, which I give two thumbs up, titled, Our Capitalist Civilization's Last Shot, or How Proposed Solutions only deepen the problem, and he has an excellent photo of, uh, I don't know what kind of mine this is, but, uh, you know, a perfect photo description of the state of the planet. <clears throat> so anyway, he just kind of frames this, he or she frames this essay kind of as a general idea of, of what they write out. I'll call them they, I guess. I'll sound like one of these pronoun-confused uh, lefties. We'll, we'll just call B, they. <clears throat> for those of my readers who, thought, who follow this blog, for a while now it has probably become pretty much clear that this global capitalist high-tech industrial civilization is slowly over. What we are experiencing these days is nothing but an opening to a period of long, slow decline. Taking decades, if not a century, to unfold, barring a literal Armageddon unleashed by fundamentalists seeing it as a way to redemption, the underlying dynamics, however, are common to all previously lost societies, no matter how sad it is, all civilizations rise and fall in familiar patterns, 
and ours is by no means an exception. What can our leaders and the political class in general do about it? What are the proposed ways to avert our fate? This is going to be the topic of today's post. So take it away, B. <clears throat> Renewable energy, there you go. Renewable energy is what seems to get all the attention in fighting off climate change and beating those nasty petrol states at the same time. These resources are said to bring electricity prices down. After all, these are the cheapest sources of electricity nowadays and give us the only, <laughs> the only hope of continuing our comfortable lifestyles in the West. <clears throat> After half a century of hand-waving, though, touting how electricity generated by nuclear power will be too cheap to meter, or how power generated by renewables will be so abundant it will be virtually for free. Oil, gas, and coal are still powering 85% of the real economy, just like 50 years ago. <clears throat> Uh, Germany's year-ahead electricity contracts testify after having went through a whopping 500% increase over the past year. We are not quite there yet, but will we ever reach this utopia? Hardly. After I have spent the last year researching whether such a major change in energy resources is possible, I have to say it is not very likely. Contrary to modern beliefs, we simply lack the resources, technologies, and time to replace fossil fuels with anything else at scale. Fuels, which besides overheating the planet, are coming closer and closer to the brink of their own terminal decline. As I keep warning my readers, for almost a year now, this crisis was not born out of a war or a much-touted rebound after a pandemic. <clears throat> These events only made it worse. Much to my surprise, these facts in my earlier statement published 10 months ago were finally confirmed by the Financial Times, only stopping short of admitting that peak oil is here. I guess we don't have to wait long for that to be admitted to, only to be used as a, and I don't know what this term means, guys, only to be used as a casus belli, C-A-S-U-S-B-E-L-L-I, educate this clueless moron, please, only to be used as a casus belli against not-so-cooperative states or making others a protectorate. This is a major, major issue which cannot be resolved by adding renewables to the grid and hoping that, in, in, that industries which were made possible by fossil fuels in the first place will switch their energy sources and all their related equipment overnight, <clears throat> if it is possible at all. This series of articles might be a good start to understand what makes me say so, and then he has a link to, good lord, how many uh, other articles uh, breaking all of this down. <clears throat> In a nutshell, this energy crisis started well over a year ago is not an anomaly. This is but a taste how the end of the fossil fuel age will look like. Dirty, 
uneven and hallmarked with extraordinary stupidity. So what is the real issue here? Technological aspects aside, such a switch in energy consumption still completely fails to address our civilization's core predicament. In fact, it only deepens the untold crisis of our time, the unsustainable drawdown of both natural and mineral resources. The ultimate reason behind every civilization's failure. Climate change, pollution, the sixth mass extinction, pandemics, supply chain breakdowns, wars, crisis upon crisis. These are all telltale signs of us overshooting our possibilities. Now we must fight tooth and nail to stay on to stay on top of all these problems all at the same time. If the world were a rational place led by rational forward thinking people, we would simply admit as a society that the era of unsustainable growth is over and the inevitable onset of contraction is upon us, <clears throat> that we would need to shrink our activities until we reach a sustainable, steady state, something which would be considered perfectly normal and widely accepted. <clears throat> As a logical outcome, we would aim <coughs> to power down and strive for a peaceful population decline via birth control and women's education to prevent wars and conflict. <clears throat> we would make international agreements on how to use less of Earth's remaining resources and how to leave a healthier planet to our descendants carried out carefully and in a coordinated manner, this planned degrowth would hit many birds with one stone, effectively reducing pollution load of all kinds, not just CO2, resource and ecosystem drawdown, delaying the onset and reducing the severity of climate change while preventing poverty and hunger. Mind you, there is nothing revolutionary in this as the old adage goes, if you find yourself in a hole, the first thing to do is to stop digging. Greens, meaning you know the little lefty greenies, are uh, correct by saying that we should stop drilling for oil, but we should also stop digging for rare minerals, drawing down finite reserves of water and polluting rivers and the groundwater with a radioactive toxic sludge. We need to stop digging our own graves. As a recent editorial in The Guardian rightly observes, <clears throat> I'm not sure who the uh, author of this is, <clears throat> mining for rare earth minerals generates large volumes of toxic and radioactive material. The transition to climate neutrality cannot mean replacing a reliance on dirty fossil fuels with a dependence on raw materials, the extraction of which leaves large tracts of the earth uninhabitable. Guy-Long, I'm going to call him William, Petron wrote in his book, The Rare Metals War, that over the next three decades, we will need to mine more mineral oil ores than humans have extracted over the last 70 
thousand years. Square this with saving the planet. Now, back to reality. Getting the political class to jump on board the degrowth bandwagon is a fool's errand. Their power is not based on their goodwill to help the people they rule over, but on wealth and how to make more of it. They were selected based on their merits to disregard human needs and their talents in serving nobody but a set of powerful plutocratic supporters. It increasingly looks like that Pulitzer Prize winner Chris Hedges was right in saying, quote, there is no way in the American political system to vote against the interest of Goldman Sachs. It's impossible, close quote. Well, if I may correct that, there is no way in any political system to vote against the interest of the ruling elite. It is impossible. Contrary to what politicians would like us to believe, it is not them, <clears throat> but the latter group of people, the billionaire plutocratic class, are the ones who are calling the shots. It is this ever-changing group of people based on which industry wields the highest lobbying power who provide their favored politicians with election budgets while expecting in return lax legislation, tax breaks, subsidies, and fat government orders. <clears throat> Is it any wonder that plundering the planet under the disguise of the law and international trade deals is so profitable. As coal, oil, and gas reserves slowly deplete and fail to provide the immense gains extracting them provided for the elites, the wealthy <coughs> now turn their eyes toward the green movement. A quick sift through the main titles on the number one source for oil and energy news tells it all. And I think <clears throat> that he's referring to oilprice.com as the number one source for oil and energy news. I'm not quite sure. So here are a few headlines. <clears throat> from the oil and energy uh, in, in investment sector. <clears throat> the unstoppable growth of carbon markets. Big oil looks to capitalize on the $1 trillion offshore wind boom. <clears throat> How to play the surge in lithium demand. Clean energy stocks are shining. The $369 billion promise that sent clean energy stocks soaring. It looks like that it has never been more profitable to save the planet. <clears throat> Civilization. Okay, the ruling class, than ever before. Don't ask just invest. The more capitalism, the better. Seen from the halls of power, what we are presented with as a, quote, boom in renewables is really nothing more than the last run of the same old planet plundering model, which has elevated modern day empires to their current status. No one voted for the original run, but somehow we were made to believe that mining the entire planet for rare resources and pouring it chuck full with pollutants will be good for us. Yeah, I want a slice of that cake too. 
So let's look at a historical analog. Yet we are constantly told by our corporate rulers how renewables are going to redistribute power in both meanings of the word and somehow make previous wrongs good. But is this reality the case? Note the following similarities with drilling for oil, our mining coal and turning these resources into energy and products. One can observe quite a few interesting parallels at work here. <clears throat> Number one, there are mining companies and governments controlling the supply of lithium, rare earth metals, polysilicon crystals, and so on. Unlike food or firewood you planted yourself, you cannot grow these resources in your garden. <clears throat> Number two, due to the nature of their geology and the complex technologies needed for their extraction, supply will always be limited and capitalized. Number three, we already see huge refineries and battery mega, mega battery factories popping up out of the ground, polluting the air and groundwater around them, built by large multinational corporations made possible by tax legislation and tax holidays. Number four, <clears throat> there are landlords slash governments leasing large swaths of land for mining metals or installing solar and wind, eager to collect their rents for doing nothing but sitting on the fence. <clears throat> Number five, there are banks lending money for the huge upfront investment. There are subsidies lobbied for, large amounts of money changing hands, bribery, corruption, and all the usual tidbits of doing business with governments. <clears throat> Number six, while the sun or the wind might seem like an unlimited source of energy, the raw materials out of which panels, batteries, turbines, and all the rest are the rest are made from completely finite resources already used by a number of other businesses. Depletion in peak supply is very much a real concern already, especially with copper as supply bottlenecks and price spikes started to show their teeth. <clears throat> so what is the difference between building out this green utopia and getting more fossil fuels then? In my opinion, not much. We should be using renewable energy as a parachute to land us safely in a de-industrialized world, not as a means to continue this batshit crazy model. <clears throat> Which brings us to same shit, different day. If you think that the wealthy and powerful will limit themselves or let this tasty mammoth herd roam free, letting individuals hunt them and reap the benefits, then chances are that you are wildly deluding yourself. The system is heavily rigged to benefit corporations, regulators, and all the unnecessary intermediaries, not the end users installing the panels on their roofs. This is the crux of our predicament, and the predicament of many prior civilizations who have already completed their own cycles of rise, prosper, and fall. Their elites simply cease to be a creative minority and become nothing more than a burden on their society. 
In our case, this category involves the plutocrats themselves as well. They have become senile and very much like the powerful, the proverbial old dog knowing only one trick on how to do business. <clears throat> thinking that we still live in the good old days when resources were abundant and the consequences of spending them were far, far away. Now that the consequences have arrived, our elites find themselves in crisis after crisis amounting to a long emergency. I doubt, however, that any of them will realize what the real issue of our time is. Instead, they will continue to mistreat our predicament which begs for less technology and plundering, not more of the same. While being busy continuing ecocide by different means and amazed by their own technocratic powers, our elites forgot about the mounting problems at the bottom half of the society. Unplanned deindustrialization, rising food and energy prices, increasing inequality, an overall cost of living crisis, all begging for a correction which, if delayed too long, might neither be rational nor technical, but visceral, based on a religious belief that the end days are here and the sinners of the world must burn in a cleansing fire, an all too familiar pattern near the end days of a civilization's era of rationality and its losing touch with reality. But more on that in a different post. Until next time, signed B. <laughs> Amen, brother or sister B. Anyway, there you go. You heard it again on Medium.com. And as I say, there's two more essays uh, that I could have read just as well as this one. But now that that is uh, over with, I'm going to continue talking to myself and uh, making an audio book out of a book that I wrote in 2009. Uh, so I'm back talking to myself. Get out there and talk to yourself and preach to the choir while you still can. Bye, guys.